Outstanding photographer, noted mostly for your platinum print landscapes, had your work shown internationally and included in many collections in major museums here, such as MoMA and the Met. Lois, if you could describe yourself using one word, what would it be? Maybe I'm an adventurer. Maybe I'm curious about the unknown, and even it's not the 19th century, but it's the unknown to me that, that, that makes me curious. Whether it's a rooftop uh, that somebody said I could go photograph from in Brooklyn, or you know, a chance to um, you know, climb a mountain that I've never climbed. I, I don't know what I'm going to find there. But you know, I have an idea, and, and I love letting that idea behind when I'm actually faced with the real thing. Lois Corner is a well-known photographer, mostly recognized by platinum print landscapes. Her relationship with China started a long time ago. Shortly after, she decided to take a class on the Ming Dynasty at Yale University, where she received her MFA in photography and eventually went on to become the director of the undergraduate photography program, as well as a critic and professor for their graduate program. I've known Lois Connor's work for a long time. She's been at this a long time. I've always thought that I knew her work. Uh, but a friend of mine suggested that I go visit her and look further to understand her more as the artist that he knew her as. I went ahead and made a meeting with her and met her at her studio. And there she sat me down and opened up these beautiful books of platinum prints. And as I went from page to page, I noticed images from around the world. And I was fascinated by the similarities of all of these places. When I went to um, Yale, we had to take three electives, and they could be anything. You mm -hmm. could take a physics class, or you could take a um, creative writing, or a philosophy, or a drawing class. You could do whatever yeah. you wanted, but you had to take three electives outside your major. And um, I did all art history. Oh, wow. And um, I just, uh, just by chance, I thought, what do I know about the Ming Dynasty? except, you know, in some part of my imagination, I thought maybe I knew a little bit. And, um, I, you know, it's just, it was so startling and, and, and also intimidating. And everybody was um, a, a, a PhD student. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I thought after the first class that I couldn't do it. And I approached my professor and he said, well, we need somebody like you because you look at a different, you look at the, you look at the paintings in a different way because you're coming as a creator. Yeah. And so that gave me the confidence and um, I asked all sorts of questions that were probably kind of ridiculous. We were looking at some um, Ming Dynasty paintings of the Guilin landscape and it, it just seemed so fantastical, like um, a Dr. Seuss drawing <laughs> or something rather, you know, something uh, made up. And I said, well, why did they imagine that mountains look like that? And he says, it's a real place. And it really looks like that. And so that put the seed in my, my brain that, that, that I needed to go and look at that. How was your first trip, your first impression? Do you remember? It was very different, and it was completely different how I imagined it might be. And what I, in, I intended to spend the whole fellowship time, which I, I wanted to spend nine months in, in Guilin, Yangshuo. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for a few months, and I thought, well, it's amazing, I could spend my whole time here, but I don't know anything about what China is. Does the rest of China look like this? Yeah. Um, so then I started to travel, um, not only within China, but then every time I went every year, I traveled the periphery of China, so I could know, you know, the influences on, on the culture and, you know, the people and, you know, to, I don't, I guess to have a melt, more rounded view of what I was looking at. And I keep going back to Guilin. And That's I keep what going I was going to ask you. Yeah. What specifically keeps you going back it's every year, it's imagine, it's, Well, I mean, there's a reason I go back to Guilin all the time. It's very different for the reason I go back to the, explore the rest of China. But I feel like that there's so many unanswered questions. I mean, after I was there for nine months, I felt like I knew nothing. And I was back in the States for six months, and then I went back for nine more, uh, six more months. and. It's, it's just, in a way, it's almost unknowable. I guess it's curiosity and 
you know, I, I, I now I have a life there. I have, I know artists and I have really good friends. I have friends in Guilin and Hangzhou and Beijing, mm -hmm. Shanghai, and um, along the Silk Route and down the Yangtze River and, and Xinjiang and Tibet. And I, I, I you know, I, I need to be there. Uh, I pretty much known of her portraiture and mostly her Chinese work. And then I was reminded by looking through these books of the beautiful images that she did uh, in New York City. And then I started seeing the rooftop views in Tibet um, or Turkey. I saw landscapes from the Badlands and Cappadocia, uh, China. And it was amazing to see the similarities in the dialogue between the mountain ranges of the American West and the Guilin Mountains of China. What are some of your favorite things to capture once you're there? Life on the street, you know, like, I mean, if you're talking about Beijing, I photograph something very different there than I do in, say, Yangshuo or, mm -hmm. you know, along the Silk Route or, um, I'm interested in that idea of landscape as culture and that, that there's certain um, things that signify, like the history that's behind and the history that's, that you're living and the, what may be coming. And um, I think to be at this time of flux in China's history was a great privilege. And, and it's still in that flux. And, and um, trying to describe something for myself in a narrative way through my medium is just, you know, a great, Absolutely. it's thrilling. Most of the time with a photograph, because it's a split second, you're thinking about that moment caught in time. With Lois's work, it goes beyond that. It suggests uh, a history of the place and the people that live there, the cultures. When you start thinking about a photograph in those terms, uh, it, it it makes the world a smaller place. You get a sense of connectedness from her work that you don't find often uh, in photography. You find it very rarely in landscape work. Lois' latest release is a book called Beijing Contemporary and Imperial, a large visual tour of modern China, which gives us a chance to ponder on China's growing power while looking at its history and cultural scenery. Her technique isn't simple, and nowadays many people would call it old-fashioned. She carries very heavy equipment, takes her time, photographs in black and white for the most part, then goes through a long process to develop and print her films. This exhibition celebrates her recent release of uh, the book on Beijing and incorporates a few of those images. But what it also does is it ties together those recent works with the history of this sort of photography that she's been enamored with for so many years and ties together work from around the world to, that makes you feel uh, that the world's a smaller place, that there's this sense of continuity and harmony in the land that we're a part of, and thus the cultures and the people that exist in these lands um, aren't so, maybe not so as different as we like to think they are. You still use a camera that was originally used in the 19th century. Why? Well, they still make them, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not using 19th century cameras per se. I'm mm -hmm. using modern cameras that, that look like the mm -hmm. old cameras. Um, one reason, probably the biggest reason is um, I like looking through the ground glass. I like having the privilege of pausing, pausing for a long time, whether it's on the street making a portrait or whether it's making a landscape. I don't have to be in a hurry. I can be very deliberate. I can take my time. I can walk around. Um, sometimes where I put the camera down, you know, because I carry it across my shoulder as I'm going through the landscape or mm -hmm. going through the city or Central Park or wherever I'm photographing. And, you know, sometimes when I first put it down and I look through, I'm like, the camera knows. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, you know, looking at through the ground glass transforms the landscape slightly from the landscape itself. First of all, it's upside down and it's backwards. Mm -hmm. So like you can see it formally in a little bit more abstract terms and um, I think you're a better critic 
because it is upside down and backwards. If you get confused, you can go out and the landscape is still the same yeah. way. Um, but I, I, yeah, there's, for those reasons, I like taking my time. I like the abstractness of it. And you know, I'm photographing mostly in black and white, although I make a lot of color pictures. I'm back to using the eight by 10 a lot now too. Oh, okay. But I use that for color. And how long does it take to develop the film? Like how much effort out of you goes into it? A lot. I mean, I spend a lot of time, because I, I make my own prints, I mm -hmm. develop my own film, I carry my own camera. And how long does it take? Wow, it's a lot of work. It is. I mean, the first time I went to China, I was there for um, almost nine months, and so all the film that I shot, I'm carrying around from city to city. And it, it's a lot to get it on and off the train with all I that film. I mean, each sheet of film is seven by 17 inches. and. And I'm not seeing the work, which is really hard. Like, what if everything failed? Mm -hmm. Like, what if there's a light leak? What if, you know, I had like nightmares about that. And then when I came back, you know, I had hundreds and hundreds of sheets of film. So yes, I mean, each, each piece of film to develop the film takes me about 20 minutes. And uh, when I first started um, developing this film, I did five or 10 sheets at a time, but now, um, then I'm older and more mature and willing to spend even more time. I only do two sheets at a time, so it really takes a lot of time. And, but uh, you know, I, now I develop the film in a tank um, and it's a little bit more even and I can actually do it in the daylight so I can, you know, read or something while I'm doing it or do my emails, you know, <laughs> because I'm, uh, you know, watching the tank and taking the chemicals in and out. But um, I think it's all part of it. The printing takes a long time, this kind of printing, the platinum printing, because each time I'm sensitizing a piece of paper, I don't necessarily get a good print. Yeah. So it may be days before I get a good print or I could immediately get a good print. So I sensitize the paper with salts of iron, salts of platinum, expose it to intense UV light and then develop it all in the daylight because it's very slow. I think in this day and age, uh, for an artist to be photographing herself printing herself. Um, I mean, she sensitizes all the papers uh, b with platinum uh, in order to print them. And that level of uh, craft and control uh, is incredible. Um, most of the time today, you don't hear people talking about the process so much anymore as a level of craft, more as a, a stylistic affectation. And for her, Obviously taking the photograph is the most important thing, but the decisions that she's making in the darkroom uh, are equally as important. And the nuances that she's interested in may not be readily apparent to everybody, but if you see one of her proof prints, almost everybody would think would be a finished print and is exquisite, but when you see it next to the finished print, you can see how much energy a uh, soul she puts into her work. In 1988, Lois was in Beijing studying, and while visiting its imperial garden, she started photographing the lotus flower. In no time, she realized she was smitten by every aspect of the flower. The lotus has been prominent in her works ever since gaining a distinctive look through her lenses. Along with plans to work in the Middle East, Lois plans on dedicating an entire book to the lotus flower very soon, starting, of course, in China. Her uh, composition using the uh, banquet camera format um, and the way that she presents her view allows one to both appreciate the place uh, that she is honoring and captivated by and notice the nuances of light texture pattern in a more abstract way as well. So the landscape is no longer just a vista of reality, but a aesthetic object seen through her eyes. And when you can have a work of art that exists both as a um, document or artifact of a certain place and an aesthetic object, it has the ability to last much longer. You seem to be a little bit infatuated with the lotus flower, you know, <laughs> it makes appearances in your works several times. A lot more than you know. <laughs> yeah. What is its significance to you? Well, you know, in high school I was called Lois and Lotus. Oh. 
because um, there was a car called the Lotus, and mm -hmm. but I never thought of it, anything of it. But kind of retrospectively, maybe that was my kind of destination. Um, I was living at um, Beijing University, studying Chinese for a semester in '88, and right outside are part of the are part of the old Imperial Gardens, and um, though. I've looked at Lotus many times. I didn't really photograph Lotus, but they were right there. I saw them every day, and so I started to photograph them. And um, probably I was looking at a little bit more paintings of Lotus and seeing more representations of them, and um, I think I got bit by the bug. But the real transformation was like when I was in Hangzhou. Hangzhou is in southern China. It's also very steamy and wet and it can rain for days. Mm -hmm. I, I went there to photograph for a couple weeks and it rained every day and I thought, well, I'm here. I'm going to figure it out. I'm working in black and white and, and if you're taking a distant photograph in black and white and it's flat light, it's just nothing. It's a great mm -hmm. card. Yeah. But I thought, well, if I move in and the lotus you know, um, are reflecting in the water, but they're not, there's no shadows. So like the illusion of space is, is really quite remarkable because you can't really tell, everything becomes on the same plane, which is something that Chinese painting does, early Chinese painting even, you know, the, bringing the foreground and the background together. So it just started me making a different kind of picture. So it was the flower that attracted me or like the colossalness of, of the flower and the plant, but also the possibilities of making a different kind of picture. And the lotus, as you know, it, it goes through its season, changes. And I'm just interested in every aspect. I love it when it's flowering. I love it. I love those giant leaves. And I love it when it's, you know, disintegrating into the ice or the, the dirt. And, you know, it's just from zero to, you know, colossal. It's just, um, you know, it, it's not like I really set out to do that, but it kind of found me. It's an empowering feeling that I get from her work that I think is rather singular. Um, I, when I notice uh, Lois Connor's work, I can recognize it from across the room in a group show with many other photographers. It's incredibly distinctive. And I think because of that, it will last. And a lot of people, uh, feel the same way because uh, many people have collected her work, uh, not just privately, but also with museums throughout the world. The National Museum of Art in Washington did a retrospective of your work recently, and how did that feel? Because, you know, you still have a long road ahead of you, and how right. did it feel having a retrospective done? Well, obviously a great honor. and. Absolutely. Um, but, but that was really interesting because it was a retrospective of the work that I'd done in Asia to that mm -hmm. point. And um, what it allows you to do it, do, I didn't think of it as a re retrospective like, oh, I deserve this retrospective because I've done that much work. But what it made me do and what they encouraged me to do is to sort of kind of look at it, step back and look at it, you know, sort of finalize some of the things I'd been working on. And, and, and really stop and think about it. Because you don't, like when you're doing your work, you know, you may have exhibitions, but a large exhibition like that really allows you to stand back and say, oh, this is what I've done. This is what I've accomplished. Where am I going from here? And you don't even know that you've done that much. I don't know if that makes any sense, because yeah. you have small exhibitions. But this was eight rooms of photographs. and. And people really kind of pouring uh, over my work and asking me a lot of questions and trying to make sense of it for them, which also made me think about my work in a different way. So yeah, it was it was kind of a milestone when I think of like you know what I've been doing and it'll, you know it was a great privilege to be able to pause and say okay, look back. Right? Yeah, yeah. Your latest piece, Beijing Contemporary and Imperial was in Cleveland, Cleveland Museum this year, and even in Australia, it's right. been around. What's next? Well, I mean, I will continue the, the Beijing work. Um, I, I would like to work on a Lotus book next, um, you know, because there's a lot of work. When you, when you, when you do a book, it, it's like the exhibition that we were just talking about at the Sackler. Um, it allows you to sort of look back and look forward and figure out 
what you need to do to make it more complete or what you want to do to sort of expand what you've already done. And so that's, that's I'm going to China um, middle of October. I was going to go to in July, but I broke my arm. Um, I wanted to go in July because that's when the lotus are blooming. And I haven't mm -hmm. really photographed the, the lotus blooming. I'm actually more interested in the stems and the, the leaves. But I thought, well, that'll be my challenge. But then I broke my arm. So I'm going to be there at my favorite time of the year, October. And it's going to be remarkable. I've spent a lot of time photographing lotus. But um, I've also spent a lot of time in the American West. And I keep going out there, especially to Canyon de Chez, the Navajo Reservation. What are some future projects or plans that you can let us know about? Well, I want to start photographing in the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dubai in particular. Um, I'm interested because it's a landscape that was kind of built out of nothing and now huge buildings and they're still sort of, you know, filling in with the sand and, you know, making even more kind of all this earthsats building in the middle of, of the desert. It just, and I've seen a lot of photographs of it, and I just feel that there's something for me there. I, I love the desert. I've photographed many of the deserts in the world, and um, I, I love that kind of light and that flatness and that kind of um, feeling that you're seeing a mirage, um, and it becomes this real place, you know, the idea of the oasis. So. For me, Dubai becomes an oasis that I, I really need to sort of experience and think about. But I will always go back to China. I'll still go back to China at least once a year, if not twice a year. It's some, it's you know, what, what do I know? I know a little bit, and I, I, I need more. And um, I'll continue out west and with the lotus. And um, you know, I'm excited about the color work that I'm doing. It's it's very different. For me, art is about personal expression and how uh, an individual can express themselves through a medium of choice. Uh, obviously, Lois's medium is photography, and she is a, a master printer. Um, her platinum prints are as good as anything I've ever seen um, by more famous photographers that came before her. As a gallery, you want to find an artist that adds to the dialogue of the tradition that they are a part of. The dialogue and the tradition of landscape photography is a long one that goes back to the beginnings of the medium. And to add to that in a significant um, and stylistically unique sort of way is incredibly difficult. If you were to send out a message to your students or you know a struggling artist who want to be able to do this one day and just maybe just put to people in general what would it be what would you say to them I mean what I always say is, is, is just you know to keep pursuing that thing don't give up because you know around you people may seem your classmates or your friends may be getting some attention but that doesn't mean attention won't come your way but it also doesn't mean that attention is the only thing. I mean, you have to make the work for yourself. And um, I, you know, I, I have been very lucky, but also, you know, I've, I've struggled too. And, it's, and I would say even right now, I'm still in some ways struggling and still trying to figure it out. It's, I don't think that there is one right answer is just to keep working. It's, you know, and sort of believe in what the work you're doing.